Good morning, Sugarland. We're going to take a little journey in space and time as we head into the break. And this is of particular interest to me because I have this vision about humanity as an expanding species that is not limited to one world, this planet Earth, but in the future will inhabit many worlds, not just in this solar system, but in other solar systems that we're still discovering day by day, week by week, month by month, as the Kepler mission shows us that our world Earth is, in fact, not unique in the galaxy and pro probably not in the universe. I want you to imagine the world 50 years from now. The, date is, the star date is 2062. And, and what are we as a species? Where are we? Are we limited to this one planetary body where we are still arguing over resources, being unkind to each other? Limited in our adolescence as a species in this two-dimensional world where we think that the scarcity of resources is somehow a limitation to us? Or in 50 years, do we imagine that we have, we have broken, the, broken the bounds of the gravity of Earth and have been habiting space in low Earth orbit where we have continuing facilities and access through both government and private sector rockets and spaceships? Or can we be a little bit more bold than that? Can we think that maybe in 50 years we'll be actually living on other worlds? The moon, Mars, perhaps the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, perhaps farther? Or is it possible in 50 years, in 2062, we will have discovered as we expand as a space-faring sp civilization that we are not in fact alone in the universe, that there are other intelligences that share the mystery of the universe with us, that are, as we are, seeking to understand our place in it. Could we be joining the Encyclopedia Galactica? Could there be this universal knowledge with civilizations and species that are perhaps thousands, millions, or maybe billions of years in advance of where we are in our infancy as a species? Where could we be in 50 years? Where were we 50 years ago? How many in this audience remember where we were 50 years ago? Look around. This is about the inspiration of the next generation. I was an orphan of Apollo. I remember watching Neil and Buzz bouncing around, vaguely, uh, on those TV screens. As I was watching Star Trek, where we as a species were boldly going where no one has gone before, as Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke were painting the screens in the theaters with 2001 A Space Odyssey and blowing our mind about what might be possible as we learn that our myopic ideas of what it is to be alive, right, are completely eclipsed by the reality of the universe once discovered. So orphans of Apollo, like myself, grew up with this expectation that as we graduated college and university, we would be part of this fantastic future. We'd be going to Mars, we'd be flying through the stars on starships. Of course, that didn't happen. As a species, we went to the first world, the moon, in 1969, July 20th, and for the very first time, human footprints touched another world. It took less than a decade to do that, this fantastic initiative by humanity driven by a passionate president of a certain nation called the United States that set in place a goal that was so audacious that technology didn't exist. The materials that had to go into the technology that had to be invented didn't exist. It was slide rules, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and, and, and President Kennedy said, we shall do so within a decade. Where is that boldness today? We did it. But faster than we had achieved it, much faster, we abandoned it 
we set foot on another world for the first time in 1969, and we left in 1972, never to return. Why? We had taken those first tentative steps off our first world onto another world, this planetary archipelago. The moon gives us this island on the horizon. And were we Polynesians, perhaps seeing these islands, we would be inspired to invent the technologies and learn how to paddle in our waters close to our shore before we venture off under other worlds. What a wonderful neighbor, what a wonderful circumstance we have to have this moon so convenient. But we abandoned it. But those of us that were so inspired by those events said, we want this future. We want to invent it ourselves. Today you see a whole new excitement and vision and drive towards space. You see not just the fantastic achievements by NASA, who continues to explore and press the, found, the frontiers, and as we see with the fantastic landing of Curiosity on Mars, how many saw that wondrous event? I mean, my gosh, I was stunned. I, my jaw dropped. They actually did it. That was amazing engineering that also cost $2.6 billion and involved thousands of people. NASA does wonderful, wonderful things. But what's happened in the last 50 years is NASA has also become wrapped around the axle of repetitive technologies and transportation, where in, past, in the past and many other industries, the examples have been when a, one thing has to be done once, it's likely a government. When something has to be done over and over and over again, it's likely a business opportunity. So in aviation, we saw the initial R&D and, and risk reduction taking place through government investments, and then the private sector took over, and we can fly from New York to Paris for $500 now, unlike the achievement that Charles Lindbergh had to aspire to in 1927 to do so himself, which took the attention of the world, much like the first steps on the moon, took the attention of the world. Today we have the Richard Bransons, the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos of the world, the Paul Allens, the Naveen Jains. Those people who gave us a whole complete revolution in computer technology are now investing their wealth in achieving the private sector destinations in space. Right now, we have more capital invested, focusing so few people that has never before happened in history. You and I can now buy a ticket to space. In 2004, Spaceship One flew to space for the first time, a private spaceship. Now Virgin Galactic is commercializing that opportunity where it's going to be an industry. Unlike what happened in Apollo, now we have private companies reaching for the moon, myself included. And those first robotic emissaries that will return to the moon and, and give us the experience with immersive technologies and provide us this platforms for presenting experiments and learning about the science and the commercial opportunities will be followed by people, will be followed by you and me. And it's this new era of exploration and this epic that we live in that I think is just so fantastic. We live in a world today where the first people who did step on another world, Neil and Buzz, are still here. They're still with us. You can have lunch with them. You can call them. You can talk to them. This is the very first time ever, and never will it be again, an epic such as we live in today when humanity takes its first steps off the planet, becomes a multi-planet species. When history looks back on us, this will be the era for the first time where we actually stepped off our world and became one with other worlds. I think it's the power of innovation entrepreneurship that will power much of what we do in the next decades. In order for us to... It's not about just boldly going. It's about boldly staying. And it's really important that we have the right synergies between government and private sector entities, that which powered the explorations and settlements of the West, of the Americas. It's, it's not much different. The moon is an eighth continent. If you look at its landmass, if you put the Americas together, that's the surface area of the moon. It's a really big place. And we've barely scratched the surface, maybe a fraction of a percent, 
of exploring that world. Twelve human beings have walked on it. And only a handful of robotic landers have explored it. The information that's coming back from probes that are circling the moon right now is revealing an entirely different world than we thought was there in the 1960s. We thought it was a dead, dry rock. Well, guess what? It's not. There's water on the moon. Lots of water. Great lakes of water. It's not easy to get. It's frozen. It's largely dispersed in the regolith uniformly around the moon, and it's concentrated at the poles, but it's there. And there are other volatiles there. There's also precious resources, planetary resources, things can, that can leverage our ability to become a multi-planet species, that help the economics of space become a reality, maybe even benefiting Earth. We know there's evidence that there could be more platinum group metals on the surface of the moon than all the reserves of Earth. Platinum's not just really shiny and pretty, it's a very useful, useful element. I think the most important elements that we'll discover on the moon and Mars and other places is the stuff that we don't know about. Because when we venture into these new worlds, when we commit ourselves to exploration, when we take that risk, it's that which we can never imagine that creates the opportunity. It's that, it's that discovery. When I was young, my, one of my greatest mentors was Arthur C. Clarke, in addition to Carl. I was very fortunate to become friends with both. And uh, Arthur had a, um, a way of predicting the future with great accuracy, <laughs> if you read his books. But it was an extrapolation of, of uh, the, the art. It was the art of the possible using known science and technology by predicting what the future might be like. And he often talked about what it would be like if you were actually a group of intelligent fish getting together in council chambers and trying to, trying to think about why it would be, be important to go on the line to go onto the land? What, what could you possibly find there? What do you, could you do as intelligent fish on the land? Well, you could talk about a lot of things. You can imagine all the things you could do and flap around. And, but you wouldn't think of fire. So it's, it's the immersive environments that we put ourselves into as human beings on those frontiers. The boundary conditions of innovation happen at these collisions of these frontiers. We've talked today even about engineering and biology and that is, and how that comes together in space. And as we as human beings, these biological creatures that um, are emanating from this one planetary body and, and expanding out into space, we ourselves find ourselves becoming transformed very quickly. Human beings exposed to a space environment start to transform. Um, much of that is, talk, is, is, uh, is conveyed as uh, human beings just aren't designed to be in space. Our bodies react very negatively to being in space. Bad things start to happen. We, our muscles atrophy and we have calcium loss in our bones. And Maybe it's because our bodies know how to be in space. So maybe it's not Homo sapiens that will ultimately be the descendants of humanity that venture into space, but maybe it's something like Homo spatians. Something that is more transitional and something that envelops the exponential technologies that are impacting our worlds in ways that make technology appear like magic to us. It's happening so fast. And this is what we teach at the Singularity University, at International Space University. We teach about the interdisciplinary subjects you need to understand how to go into space responsibly as a species. And at Singularity University, we talk about the technological, the technological advancing systems that have an exponential matrix to them. So it's not just a linear system. Things are expanding exponentially. In 50 years, on the exponential measure, we could be Starship Earth, we could be Homo Spacians, we could be a species that has responsibly learned how to be the proper custodians of our own planet, have found the infinite resources in space to feed us as a growing organization, make sure that nobody is wanting anything. And one of the ironic, ironic properties of space is that there is more wealth in space, there are more resources in space than anything here on Earth 
everything that we argue about, minerals, volatiles, real estate, everything that causes so much human strife here on this planet is, in, is, is available in infinite quantities. And the most important element is energy. As we go into space, a complete new resource opens up to us. It's like we're fighting over crumbs in a, and, and we're in a supermarket. The future is one of wonderment. It's one where we will be expanding as a planetary species into a multi-planet species. The moon will be one of the very first steps to learn how to responsibly and economically boldly stay in space as we learn to use the resources of the world in which we have explored. We, have, have, we can't take everything with us, as, which has been pointed out. We can't take the houses and the trees. We have to take the seeds, whether they be biological. And we have to learn how to live off the land. And as we move out into the cosmos, the stepping stone being the moon and then learning how to live and work on Mars, we may discover tomorrow, maybe 10 years from now, that we are, as a matter of fact, a member of a galactic civilization of which we are the newest members. And this question of whether we are alone in the universe is one that it, it, it answers very fundamental questions in our soul. And it's one that uh, is a complete mystery because the answer, no matter whether it's positive or negative, is so profound. If we are the only ones, if we are the only instance of life in a galaxy of billions, of hundreds of billions of stars, with hundreds of billions of planets, in a universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies, if we're the only ones, that's an awful waste of space, but what a profound responsibility we have as the local microcosm of life, and it's up to us. If, however, life has arisen many, many times in the galaxy and we're able to touch it or communicate with it, what a profound revelation that would be to us as well. We, the voyagers of the starship Earth, are in for a fantastic few decades. As we discover new worlds, as we learn how to send our robot emissaries, ourselves, and eventually our descendants, the homo spatians of the future, to these other worlds, we will become a multi-planet species. And most importantly, we will not be a single point of failure. I can't promise you that an asteroid is not going to wipe out all life on this Earth next Tuesday. Unlikely but it's happened before. Asteroids make very effective planetary biological cleansers. Ask any dinosaur. <laughs> they didn't have a space program. Thank you very much.